This is Information Service Engineering, lecture number 12, Basic Machine Learning, part 3. In this section of the lecture, again, we are talking about word embeddings. So it's word embeddings revisited. You remember in the first part of the lecture, when we were talking about natural language processing, right at the end, we were talking about word embeddings. And I was already giving you a glimpse of what distributional semantics really means. But now we go a bit, little bit more into details. Okay. So let's start with word embeddings. You remember, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. So this is a famous saying of John Rupert Firth. So, um, and this guy, of course, said a word's meaning is given by those words that frequently appear close by. So you know a word if you know its context words. This is one of the most successful ideas of statistical natural language processing, and this is referred to as distributional semantics. We have already talked about that. To formalize that a bit, we could say whenever a word W appears in a text, its context that we are dealing with is the set of words that appear nearby. Nearby means, for example, in a fixed size window. So go three words left, go three words right, starting from a center word. And now what we can do, we can use these different contexts that we have of the word W to build up a representation of W. And this will be in the end our word vector. So you have here this nice example about capybaras, probably you have heard of them, otherwise Google them or look at Wikipedia. So though quite agile on land, capybaras are equally at home in the water. And also a giant KB rodent native to South America, the capybara actually is the largest living rodent. And you see here the blue parts is the context words, which define or determine in the end the meaning of what capybara means. We know this already from our initial distributional semantics slide that we had in the natural language processing part. Okay, so what we are going to do now is we are going to build a dense vector. We also had this distinction between dense and of course, then these sparse vectors that are also used, for example, for information retrieval. Sparse vectors have the problem usually the number of dimensions in the sparse vectors, you remember that, equals the number of words you have in your vocabulary. This means similarity of two words usually are not really, you know, represented since each single vector for each word is orthogonal to each other, which means, yeah, there is no similarity. With dense vectors, you have the possibility to make clear which words are somehow similar. So we build a dense vector representation now for each word in the way that it is similar to vectors of words that appear in similar contexts. This is the case we want to do. Okay, you see here an example imaginary word vector for capybara. And these kind of word vectors then are distributed representations because they are determined by the context of the word. So these word vectors are also referred to as word embeddings or word representations. And now we are showing you in principle how to create these kind of vectors. And the most famous and of course one of the first um, algorithms that produced these kind of word vectors was word to vec producing dense word vectors here. So this has again also a longer history into the past. So we are not going to talk about these kind of, you know, latent semantical analysis that are possible, uh, but we are talking about word to vec here. word to vec is a framework for learning word vectors and that has been introduced in 2013 by Mikulov. How does it work? Quite simple. So the operation principle is the following. We start as always in linguistics with a large corpus of text. Now we have also a fixed vocabulary and every word in a fixed vocabulary there is represented by a vector. And now we go through each position. We call this position T in the text, which has a center word and we call this center word C and a context, which also means outside words O. And now we use the similarity of word vectors for C and O to calculate the probability of O, so the context, for a given C, a specific center word. Or the other way around, we have a given context O 
and we want to have the probability that now the center word C occurs. So these are again, you know, kind of probability and statistical things we have to uh, we have we have to calculate here. So it's of course similar to what we already did or what we already know from from NLP. Okay. What we are now going to do, how are these word vectors created? So we keep adjusting these word vectors to maximize exactly this kind of probability that, you know, for a given center word, again, the probability of a specific, you know, um, output occurs uh, or context word occurs. Okay. I know that's a bit complicated, so let's go a bit in more detail of what is really going on there. So. What we have here, we have example window. So our window size here will be three. And we process this here and we want to uh, compute then the probability of a specific word from the context. Now this is O. So context words are in the range of um, WT minus J until WT plus J and J here would be three. And WT is our center word. And you see here, Capybaras is the center word, and now we need to compute all the probabilities you have here for your um, for your context, which means the probability that you have in your context agile on land and equally uh, are equally at. The point is, if you compute this kind of probability, you don't say anything about the sequence. So you can compute the probability that all these words occur in a window of size three but you don't say anything about their sequence. So this is again, a kind of back of word approach that you do there. So the sequence doesn't count. Okay, now we switch, you know, this window by one position and then you have the center word, next one would be R. And then you would compute again for window size three, all of these probabilities that these words occur under the assumption that you have a given word um, in the middle as a center word, here R. So this is the way how it works in principle. Now, of course, we have to determine these kind of probabilities and in a way um, that we then in the end can produce vectors that more or less capture exactly this kind of statistical evidence. So what are we going to do for each position T? What we have there, we predict the context words within a window of fixed size M. So in our example, it was three, given a specific center word, W sub T. So we try to determine the likelihood, which is here the likelihood, and we call it of theta. Theta will be all of the variables that we have to optimize in the end. So the vector similarity has to be optimized here. And in the following way, so what we are going to do, you see here, this is the product over, you know, all words from one to T that you have here in your sequence. And then um, you have exactly, again, a product of all of the conditional probabilities that we have already determined and exemplified on the last pages within that given window size of size M. Okay, and now then, based on that, the objective function, also sometimes referred to as the loss function or cost function, um, that has to be uh, optimized in the end. This is called J of theta. This is the average negative like, uh, <laughs> sorry, the average negative log likelihood. And we need this to make again, then a probability out of it. And it's, this means if we want to minimize the objective function, we maximize the predictive accuracy. This is the basic idea. Okay, so how does now this minimization of the objective function work looks quite complicated. So here the problem again is we have to calculate this kind of conditional probability under the assumption we are of course having here a bunch of whatever variables theta are. The idea here is of course um, we should let's say look at the vectors we are dealing with here uh, by differentiating between the center words and the context words. So this means we use two words, uh, two vectors per word, because each word can as well be in the context or also in the center. So we are looking for two different vectors. We have V sub W if W is a center word and we have U sub W whenever W is a context word. Now, the probability 
that a context word O occurs for a center word C can of course also then be, be determined in the following way you see here and we are going to explain this uh, this formula a bit on the next page so it works in the following way that okay you have these two vectors and you want to compare them so a specific vector in the context for a specific vector in um, the center and what you do here you do the dot, uh, the dot product and that compares their similarity and the larger the dot product also the larger than the probability that you compute here will be that it really occurs so this is the basic assumption that you need here and just to make clear that everything has to stay positive we simply use here uh, an exponentiation so exponentiation to make everything positive and then of course this has to be normalized which means we have to divide it then through all of exactly these expressions for all of the vocabulary words we have here so for e every word w within the vocabulary and this interesting function is also referred to as the softmax function and um, what the softmax function does is it maps arbitrary values x to probability distributions while in a following way so max means it amplifies the probability for the largest x that you are looking at and it's soft because you know also if you have then a smaller x also it assigns then a small probability and does not you know make it simply zero so this is the softmax function which is usually used then um, for multinomial logistic regression for example or also as we see here it's the last activation function of a neural network so this is also exactly the case why and how it is used here but don't get disturbed by too much mathematics this is only to explain how exactly this then in the end works so word to vec maximizes the objective function by putting similar words nearby in the vector space so this is the way how it goes and then it uh, there are two different model variants as we have already said one is of them is referred to as skip gram there we are going to predict context words by a given center word so the center word is fixed and we want to predict what are the most likely context words for exactly this center word whereby we are not looking at the sequence so sequence is independent or the other way around this is called continuous back of words and there we're going to predict a center word from a given context which means this is a back of context words because there again the sequence um, uh, does not fall into account so therefore you know it's sequence independent skip gram or continuous back of words okay here you see these kind of architectures of neural networks with which these vectors then are in the end created so you have for cbow there you have as input the all uh, all of the context words you have one hidden layer they are small uh, small small neural networks here for word to vec and then you have in the output layer um, there will be computed then the um, vector for the center word and there softmax so the function that you have seen is on the output vector applied and for skip gram it's the other way around you have here the input layer and this is input will be, there be the vector of um, the center word and the output will be the most likely context words which are then there on the outside now if you have then optimized your output function and by that calculated then all of the you know let's say um, context vectors or, or let's say vectors for for all of the words of your vocabulary the next problem is of course you have to evaluate, evaluate that to see how well does it really work does it really reflect similarity semantic similarity of words there and one way to do that and this is kind of an intrinsic evaluation that you do there are for example word analogies another rather simple thing you will also see this then in the in the collab notebook that we are going to do is you simply look what are the most let's say um, similar words to a given word and simply look at that and then of course you as a as an examiner you can determine whether yeah these words are really similar and also the sequence somehow is in the right order so it's the right ranking or not so this is all intrinsic evaluation but the nice thing is and you know that already because i told this already to you in the in the nlp section of the lecture that 
we can do word analogies by simple vector arithmetics there. So if you have here vectors A, B, C, D, then you can see analogies like A relates to B, like C relates to D. And by that, if one of them is not given, like for example D, you can simply then determine D by a simple means of vector arithmetics that you see here. And thereby you could find out like, you know, men relates to women like king to what? And exactly at that point, of course, there should be queen. So this is kind of syntactic analogy things that you are here trying to, uh, to evaluate. One of the problems that you might have there is, of course, the information of these analogies is not always linear in this kind of vector space. And then, of course, it's hard to determine it. Then you can't do it by simple vector arithmetics anymore. However, it would also be possible to do an extrinsic evaluation. Extrinsic means you have another task that is solved then with word vectors as one of the features that you are using for this task. And for example, you can use them in named entity recognition, entity linking or classification problems. However, this kind of evaluation usually takes much longer and simply because it's unclear then whether when, if you have, let's say, bad results for natural, uh, natural uh, for, for entity linking, it's unclear whether it's only because the word vectors are not adequate, so they do not keep the similarity properties that they should have, or whether some other component in your entire system that is involved in this evaluation is, uh, let's say, the core or let's say the, 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 the cause of exactly these faults that you get. So. What you do there, usually you are replacing exactly one of the subset systems with another one. And if this improves accuracy, yay, you're one. Okay. So now you know a lot of theory of word to vec What we do then in the next section is we are going to do a short walkthrough through the word embedding notebook.